Salem. I'm also a small business owner, as many of you know, for the last 36 years. Uh, and so I am passionate about that. We've had a few previous Facebook Lives uh, where we had Dr. Uh, Dr. Bora on uh, talking about the uh, physical aspects of the, uh, of the virus. And then we had uh, a guest on talking about the mental health aspect of the virus. Uh, and now we're gonna talk about the economic uh, health of the virus uh, and, and the associated uh, situation that we have in the pandemic here in the state of Connecticut. I have two guests that we'll get to in a moment. Uh, my good friend, Dan Miser, uh, who is a restaurateur of note and uh, uh, chairman of the, of the Connecticut Restaurant Association and Andy Markowski who is the director statewide of the National Federation of Independent Business. And both will be uh, with us, first Dan on the first half hour, and then Andy the second half hour. We're going to talk about various aspects of business, um, startup, development, whatever it's going to be uh, here. But first, a few quick notes. National EMS Week uh, this week, where we, we set aside uh, some time to honor the great folks uh, that are out there providing emergency service support to all of us, especially in this pandemic. I had the pleasure of being with the Lieutenant Governor this morning uh, in New London, uh, where we honored uh, the great work of that service organization. Uh, you may know President Ford established EMS Week uh, back in 1974 as a way to honor these groups, and it takes on a significant um, a significant importance as we fight the pandemic as well as them going out there. So give a big shout out to anybody you know in EMS, uh, as well as you know a lot of a lot of uh, rightfully attention has been placed on the health uh, food pro uh, health providers uh, that are on the front lines. So uh, make sure you say thanks to them. Uh, the governor put out some uh, statistics as of yesterday, May twentieth. Uh, the statewide total of those infected is over 39,000. Uh, more than 190,000 have been tested with uh, uh, about 80, 8, 887 in the hospital. That is a declining number. Uh, that, is, that is very good. The real issue seems to be nursing homes. And there's been a lot of focus as there should be on this. This kind of got out of hand a little early. And uh, uh, the folks that are serving those residents in the nursing home and those residents in the nursing home are really in a very difficult situation. And that's where most of the, uh, the numbers are coming from. Uh, the Department of Energy Environmental Protection has a list on uh, opening state parks uh, and boating, uh, hunting and fishing, all of those licensing opportunities um, you, can, you can find on my website. Uh, SenatorFermica.com uh, is, uh, a good resource for uh, many different uh, opportunities for you to look at and find information. Uh, and if you don't find the particular information you want, or if you need help with some personal, um, uh, personal, you know, uh, problems that you may have with the Department of Labor collecting or businesses uh, looking to to find a way to get going again, uh, feel free to reach out. I have a great staff. Kim, my aide, has done yeoman's work helping constituents get uh, manage the you know the red tape of government uh, Sarah and Peggy are on this uh, Facebook uh, live event today and they're monitoring it um, basically because I, I don't have any teenagers around me here to help me get through this so they're they're helping me do it but they're also listening to your concerns and if you have any questions that we don't answer or talk about today with our great guests, then you can always contact them and, and they are taking notes to help get those answers. So um, that's a brief update. I'd like to bring uh, our first guest on, Dan Miser, who I've known for some time. I have the greatest of respect for. Um, he's in an industry, we are in an industry that is not the easiest of industries, not that there's any real easy ones anymore, but uh, you know, he started out uh, a, a while ago uh, working for the Max Restaurant Group. Uh, he decided to further his career and attended the French Culinary Institute in New York City and uh, came back to Max uh, Restaurant Group to learn uh, the business aspect. 
to balance the, you know, the fine cooking skills that he had. And in 2011, he took an opportunity to come to the Ocean House, which brought him to the greatest part of Connecticut, the, the southeastern, eastern part of Connecticut, where he operates now three uh, very good, very good, very good um, restaurants, uh, different, uh, different venues, but they're all excellent in the Mystic area, Oyster Club, Engine Room, and Grass and Bone. He's big with the Farm to Table group and uh, is, is gonna talk a little bit about that. He's part, he's part of the Stone Acres Farm. And uh, so he is a guy that uh, uh, you know walks the walk, and, and he knows what's going on. So we're very happy to have him. He's also the, the uh, president or chairman of the board of the Connecticut Restaurant Association. So welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's truly a, an honor to be here with you, and, and I love the fact that you're you're ho hosting these these events for uh, for folks in southeastern Connecticut to have an opportunity to be updated on, on where we're at uh, as a state in a region, um, given the unique circumstances that we're in. So, so thank you. So, you know, there are a lot of people that are, that are home the last, but March 17th is when we, you know, right. when the restaurants got closed uh, and a lot of businesses got closed and a lot of people that are home and that, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, years ago when the food network first came on, you know, nobody really, paid much attention to cooking and all of a sudden, you know, Emerald came on and, uh, you know, and, and kind of made cooking an art form and got people interested And in who, who would have figured all those television shows about cooking would happen uh, and uh, glamorizing the hard work that it is. But a lot of folks are out there now, they're cooking again, uh, you know, markets are, are going and there's a lot of interest. So, uh, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, a little bit about your background from your perspective and what brought you to, to lead the Connecticut Restaurant Association. I know you're on the advisory group uh, the governor put on. I, I think he, you could use some help with some more small business representation on that group, but, uh, but we really appreciate the work you're doing. So why don't you take us uh, sure. take a little bit of your history? and Yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll take a little trip down memory lane here. Um, well, it's funny you, you bring up the, the Food Network and, and my interest in cooking uh, came well before the Food Network. Um, you know, I remember growing up on Saturday mornings and, and watching, um, you know, Paul Prudhomme and uh, Jacques and Julia and uh, Justin Wilson and some of those great guys that were on uh, PBS. Um, and, and I know I've shared this story with you, Senator, but a lot of people don't know this, so I'll share it with the folks on this call. Um, when I first came to Connecticut, um, when we moved here when I was about three or four from Pennsylvania, and uh, you would know better than I because it was the, the opening year of Flanders Fish Market, but um, this is honest to goodness truth uh, story here, folks. When, when I was um, opening up Oyster Club, and when we were talking about what the, the look and the feel and the energy and the vibe that we wanted Oyster Club to be, um, I fell back on one of the strongest and earliest restaurant memories that I have. And I still um, can see it clear as day. And it was being in Flanders Fish Market um, back when it was just that tiny little building, that tiny little building that quite honestly is about the, the size that Oyster Club is now. And, and it was the fall or winter because I remember it was chilly outside and I remember going in there with my dad and there was the big fish case there and there was the lobster tanks and there was steam on the windows because there were so many people and, and so many good smells and heat coming out of the kitchen. And, um, and I remember seeing a, a guy behind the counter with a a big uh, walrus handle, handlebar mustache. And, and I came to find out years later that, that that was you. And so, you know, our, our relationship and friendship um, has certainly taken on a different form in, in terms of being fellow restaurateurs and, and um, um, you know, obviously the, the work that you do up the Capitol advocating for the region and small business and certainly restaurants. Um, but, but that story is one that, that, I love to tell because it, it truly, as, as, a, uh, as a young person, as a, a little kid being in there, that was one of those um, moments that 
all the senses were alive, right? There was these smells and sounds and there was an energy in the room from, from the guests and the, the staff and there were smiles and laughter. And it was just, I knew when we opened up Oyster Club that, that that's what I wanted it to feel like. That's what I wanted it to look like, what I wanted it to smell like. And so that has never left me. So uh, I will publicly say thank you for that. That was truly a, a, a pivotal moment in, in my life. Um, you know, my, my introduction to, to food and, and certainly being on the culinary side of, of food, which is where I started in this business, um, goes back to a, uh, a real tradition in my family of, of the outdoors. Um, to this day, I'm, I'm an avid fisherman and, and hunter and understanding where my food comes from and, and understanding um, what it takes to, to um, you know, take a, a, a beautiful fish and transform it into something that's uh, spectacular on the plate. Those are lessons that I learned um, very early on. And we have definitely um, taken that philosophy through all of our restaurants. So at Grass and Bone, which is our, our um, local uh, butcher shop, you know, we source all local meats. Uh, we buy whole animals. We do all of our butchering in-house. We do all of our own smoking and charcuterie work, dry aging. Um, same thing is true at Engine Room and Oyster Club. You know, we work with the great fishing fleet in Stonington and, and out of Point Judith, Rhode Island. Um, we work with amazing local oyster farms, uh, buying direct from them. And, and then certainly the, the land-based farming piece of it. So Stone Acres Farm, which is in Stonington, has been in my wife's family for, uh, for, for over 10 generations now. She's actually the, the 10th generation. And, uh, you know, our, our two-year-old son is, is the 11th generation to, to have um, a, a piece of that heritage and history at the farm. So we grow at Stone Acres year round. Uh, we supply our three restaurants as well as other restaurants in the area. We have a very active farm stand on site. And um, it's, it's really been, you know, there, during this, this COVID crisis over the last two months, you know, you got to look for the silver linings, right? It's, it's been brutal for, for folks across the region, the country and around the world. So you got to try to find the good. And, and one of the, the really beautiful things that, that I've seen at the farm and that we've seen at Grass and Bone, the butcher shop and market, is something that you touched on, which is this idea that, that people are getting back to the kitchen right there because of uh, social distancing and the stay home, stay safe order, um, because people are working from home. Um, they're finding more time. Um, to be in the kitchen and cooking with their family. And that's really important. Um, and, and I'm sure you're seeing it at the fish market, um, people coming in and, and, and looking for, for great local product and probably new and different product as well. You know, things that, that, you know, maybe there's a recipe they've been wanting to try out that they haven't had time um, or the energy to do because the, the normal um, daily grind of the work week um, you know, takes away from some of that. So, so of all the, the things that have happened over the last two months, I think one of the, the, the silver linings and, and really points of, of good has been this, this focus on food and cooking and, and sourcing locally. And, um, you know, you, you see it all the time. If you're, if you're on Instagram or social media, people are baking bread at home now, people that have never baked in their life. And that's really cool. You know, that's, I think that's a good thing for folks. Um, as you and I both know, being in the food world, um, you know, hopping, hopping into a kitchen or behind a stove or, um, kneading bread, you know, those are, those are moments of happiness and peace. And you can find, uh, a lot of comfort in that. And, and certainly um, in times of crisis, anything that we can do to, to find comfort is really important. So, yeah, it's, uh, and you can tell now why my beard is white and yours is not. So uh, at the distance that we go back, but uh, you know, it's a great, it's a great industry. My kids are in it. Uh, you know, you work with, with some of those on the, with Olivia on the restaurant association. Sure. Molly's done. Uh, you know, some work there. Um, and and it's, a, it's a great honor to work in this business. Um, but business is struggling now. 
industry is struggling. Uh, we've joined a, a group of restaurants where every Wednesday we provide industry meals to, uh, uh, to, to, you know, free to restaurant, uh, you know, workers who are out of work. Sure. Uh, and, you know, we need to kind of get to a place where we can get back open again. And uh, this is being uh, sent out live on Thursday uh, the 21st, the day after the governor has said, uh, restaurants can open up for outside dining and if you have it and that's kind of a mixed bag uh, um, some people have it some people don't sure. talking about rain on saturday so uh you know what do we got to do to to kind of get moving uh, and to get this industry off the ground dan you're on the advisory committee as i said early on and maybe you can yeah. Talk with that. yeah sure so um you know, one of the, one of the important things, you know, one of the things my dad always says is, you know, before going into any situation, you know, get the facts. And, and one of the, the key things to note that a lot of people don't realize in this country is that when you look at industries around the United States and, and Connecticut's no different, there is no single industry without question. There's no single industry that was hit harder than restaurants and hospitality in terms of two metrics. And, and the first metric being the number of unemployment claims. Um, you know, here in Connecticut, we saw uh, it was over 85% of restaurant owners in Connecticut um, had to lay off most or all of their hourly staff. Uh, you know, that translates to, to over 100,000 people in the state. I saw some staggering state um, unemployment data figures that came out last week. And, and when you look at the number of unemployment claims filed for working age adults in Connecticut, the hardest hit region by far was Southeastern Connecticut. It was between, depending on which town, it was between 17 and 30% of working age adults filed unemployment claims in the state of Connecticut between March and April. And the reason for that um, is because of our region's uh, tremendous dependence on tourism and hospitality. When you look at the two casinos, uh, all of the restaurants in the region, the hotels, uh, big places like the Mystic Seaport and the Mystic Aquarium, you know, you very quickly can understand why that number of depending on which town in southeastern Connecticut, but why it's at 17 to 30 percent of working age adults filed unemployment claims in those two months. So, you know, the 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 short of it is 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 that we as a state and a country, but certainly as a region in southeastern Connecticut, need to get our people back to work. And so, yes, um, yesterday being May 20th was the first day of outdoor dining for restaurants. Um, you know, the, the preliminary numbers that we saw as the Restaurant Association for restaurants that opened up their patios yesterday was less than 20 percent. Less than 20 percent of re Connecticut restaurants were able to participate in yesterday's reopening. You take that and then you couple it with the, the unknown of, of weather um, and, and you have a, a situation that proves to not be um, a viable uh, alternative to get your businesses back on track for restaurants. So, you know, yesterday was an important first step, but it is far from a solution. Um, what we are really hoping to do, many of the folks on this call may or may not know, uh, the, the phase two, um, which will be the next set of, of reopenings for businesses is scheduled right now for June 20th. One of the things that we are actively talking to the governor's office on, and, and we are hopeful that there will be some adjustment, is looking at Connecticut in a regional sense. So what I mean by that is that, you know, when you look at, at the eastern counties of New London, Tolland, and Wyndham County, um, those, those three counties um, represent 4% of the overall cases of COVID in the state of Connecticut. They represent just under 5% of the overall deaths in the state of Connecticut and 4% of the current hospitalizations. Uh, you couple that with the three main hospitals in the region, l and in New London, Bacchus in Norwich, and Westerly Hospital, um, which a lot of, even though it's in Rhode Island, a lot of folks, you know, in my neck of the woods use that as their main hospital. Those hospitals have tremendous capacity right now and, and, and are prepared, God forbid, that there is a little uptick in, in cases or a need 
um, to take on folks, they have the room to do it. So, so by all the metrics that we've been using as a state to determine when we move between phases and when we can progress, um, Eastern Connecticut is, is poised for that. So, so the good news is, is that there's a recognition of that from the administration that, that Eastern Connecticut um, is very different uh, in terms of this crisis than Western Connecticut and certainly Southwestern Connecticut. So we are hopeful. Um, there's nothing set in stone right now, but we are hopeful that Eastern Connecticut could potentially see an earlier phase two um, than what's currently slated for the June 20th. You know, one of the things that, that the governor talks about um, and has very, since very early on in this crisis is, is a desire um, in coordination with other Northeast governors to move as a full unit, right? To have this Northeast regional um, compact of, of governors and states. And I, and I understand um, the reasoning behind it. Um, but what, what I, the good news, the good news is that um, we as a state and some of the other New England states are, are quickly realizing as is the current administration that that trying to keep lockstep with New Jersey and New York um, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for us and that their situations are very different than what we're experiencing in Connecticut. So I, I think what you're going to see in the coming weeks is, is a trend to be more in line with Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Um, and, and what we're seeing and hearing from both of, of those administrations um, is a quicker pace um, certainly than, than New York and New Jersey in terms of, of getting their, their, their business community up and running. We had a, a question from Ken in Niantic about what, you know, what are we doing on that very subject? How do we deal with regional? And I think you, you, know, you answered it pretty well. We are different uh, and uh, you know, we should get some consideration with regard to that. I think that, you know, the governor has said uh, to me, and I, and I know that when you say you're talking to the governor, that's through the advisory group and through the restaurant association, you kind of have two voices sure. uh, to speak to the governor. And you wrote a letter or part of a letter that asked for a June 3rd opening of restaurants. Um, I, I uh, authored a letter yesterday that went out with a bunch of representatives and senators on it asking for a $20 million uh, emergency fund for the hospitality industry. Uh, the day before, we put something out for Mystic Aquarium uh, uh, that got shorted on their SBA note, basically, and they need to kind of resurrect that to keep their cash flow going. Sure. But we took it a step farther yesterday and said, listen, we, uh, to your point, are a hospitality uh, and tourism region, arts and culture, what we have and do. And uh, so we've asked for a 20 million set aside so that uh, businesses like the Guard Arts Theater, like, uh, uh, you know, some of these other groups, uh, the Lyman Allen Museum and, and, and depend on things inside can have some relief. So we're looking to try to do that and move that opening. But the governor's has said, well, we don't want people from, you know, uh, highly infected areas to descend on southeastern Connecticut if they're opening first in the restaurants. And, uh, you know, if we're flattening the curve by doing the things that we're doing, then we certainly have the right to have the expectation of our guests, our customers to do the same thing. And, uh, you know, and, and so we can kind of control them when they come in. They have to wear masks. And we've been taking temps of our people every shift. And, masks and gloves and you know we've been doing that since well before uh but i think we can open safely and i think uh, it's up to the good people that operate these businesses as entrepreneurs and job producers uh you know we, we can handle this and we can take care of this and we and we can open it safely and we can also monitor where we are and what's going on so yeah no i couldn't agree more and, and, I, and I think it's also important you know to realize that when, when we talk about reopening, um, and these are discussions that, that we have time and time again on the, on the reopen Connecticut advisory group, um, the idea that when we, when we say reopen, that we're somehow or another talking about, you know, what life was like in early March is simply not the case. And, and so in, 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 
the case of restaurants, you know, when we say we want to reopen indoor dining, no one, not, not, not one person on, on the group um, or, or on, uh, you know, the, the Restaurant Association board, none of us are talking about, you know, the Saturday night where we're three deep at the bar and, and people packed in like sardines. We're not talking about the, uh, the, the vivid, vivid memory that I have of, had of Flanders Fish when I was a little kid. And as much as I, I hope that we get back to that someday where we can do that safely, that's not what we're talking about. Um, you know, our staff across the state, restaurant people, um, we're ready to handle this, right? Restaurants, uh, if there was ever a group of small business folks that can handle, um, you know, cleaning sanitation protocols um, and, and things that are gonna keep our, our guests and staff safe. You know, it's restaurant people. Every day, as you know, we deal with um, safe food handling protocols, allergies, dietary restrictions, hot flames, sharp knives. Uh, we're ready for it. And so, you know, what you're gonna see in Connecticut's restaurants, um, even if you go to an outdoor uh, dining facility tonight is going to be very different than what you saw before. You're going to see, you're going to see our staff members in masks and gloves. Uh, you're going to see hand sanitizer stations all over, um, which is, you know, available for staff and guests. Um, guests are, are required to wear masks when they're not at the table or when they're at the, when they're not at the table, they don't have to have them. But when they're coming to the table, get up to use the restroom and leave, you know, uh, guests are going to be in masks as well. Uh, you're going to see six foot separations between tables. You're going to see all sorts of things that um, are, are very um, thoughtfully put together and, and very, um, uh, you know, they're, they're there for a reason. And, and, and the specific guidelines that, that we introduced um, are, are things that, we believe, and based upon the advice of, of the medical advisory folks, that there are steps that we can take to mitigate that risk. So, you know, if uh, I would encourage everyone in this call to, to go, go seek out your, your local dining establishment that's open in the coming days and, and uh, you know, show, show some support. You know, God knows they need it. Um, you know, restaurants and all small businesses, but yeah. restaurants especially are hurting right now. This is this is the big the big uh, kickoff weekend to the summer season here in Eastern right. Connecticut, probably all along the shoreline is Memorial Day weekend, and you know we have a lot of uh, beach rentals and and summer rentals, whether they're on the beach or not, are unable to be rented. Uh, those short term rentals are being prevented by the governor. Uh, you know, that's going to have an impact, I think, on the amount of people that are going to be able to come and visit and, and uh, you know, help shore up the economy. We need an answer to that. When are we going to open those short term rentals up and how can they do it safely? There's a lot of folks that depend on that uh, in these weekends, 8, 10, 12 weeks uh, is the season. That's all they have. So we need to find an answer and a solution to that. Um, you know, we have about a, a couple of minutes left. You and I could probably speak for, you know, three or four hours about, about right. this. Uh, we really appreciate the work that you're doing for the Restaurant Association and Thank for you. the advisory committee. Uh, how is that advisory committee uh, managed? And, you know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm attacking this thing from one side. The legislature has yeah. been closed. The Capitol has been closed since early March. So we're on a lot of conference calls on and pushing things one way and then industry groups like yourself and the Connecticut Restaurant Association and uh, Tim Phelan and the Retail Merchants Group are pushing from another way. And, and now this advisory board is made up of some of those. How, how do you see that? Is that being disbanded in the next week or two or, or is that moving forward? What, what's, what's going on with that? A yeah, so, so what, what we've been told, um, you know, the advisory business advisory group, we've been together now for just about four weeks. Um, and, and working uh, literally around the clock on, on putting together and, and advising. And I think it's really important to understand that, that our role um, is to just do that, is to advise. By no means does, does this group have any sort of authority in determining the final outcome. You know, those decisions rest in the hands of the governor and, and his inner circle. And, and I'm certain there's other people advising him as well. Um, privately. So, so our group um, in its official capacity 
now that we have passed this uh, May 20th, the first phase, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, we have been disbanded. Um, but that being said, uh, we've been given all sorts of assurances um, that especially folks like myself who represent the Connecticut Restaurant Association, Tim Phelan, you met, you represented, who represents the Connecticut retail merchants, um, we're still going to be in constant communication with folks in the governor's office and their team as we continue to progress through the phases and try to figure out what, what the, the nuances are to the guidelines and restrictions. And certainly, hopefully, um, trying to find ways to you know, speed up some of these things, include more people, more businesses in the reopening. Um, you know, as as more data comes out, not just from Connecticut as we move forward, but from other states that have a few weeks head start on us in their reopening. You know, once again, fingers crossed that that the the data stays uh, healthy and positive. Um, all of those things will will play into decisions that are made and how, how dates and guidelines are tweaked. So, um, you know, in my role, I know I'll still be very much involved on a daily basis and part of that conversation, but to your original question, um, the, the, the formal group as itself and in terms of our regular meetings, uh, that has been um, disbanded at this point as of yesterday. Well, let me first thank you very much, not only for being the giant in the industry that you are in, in Eastern Connecticut, and the great family that you have, uh, which is, you know, the most important, but for all you're doing to kind of help our industry and, and really every industry on Main Street, you know, move forward. And I, uh, if, if the conversations are slowing down a little bit with the advisory group, I know that I'd be happy to, to meet with you on a, and, and whoever that's around on a regular basis to help push Southeastern Connecticut. I know Senator Summers has a great interest in that as well. And we'd be happy to kind of pick up the mantle, if you will, and continue those conversations. And maybe we can attack it that way. Um, I wish you good success with your restaurants as, as we move forward. And uh, I can say that, you know, Grass and Bones had one of the greatest roast beef sandwiches. I've <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, if you're out there, do that and we'll go go see go see Dan out there. And my best to your family. We're gonna bring on Andy. And I know that you know Andy. He represents, you know, the other uh small businesses as well as some restaurants. Uh, and so he'll have a, you know, we look forward to talking to him about his take and, and what we're learning uh from him. But thank you very much for being on and we'll hope to have you back if you will. And uh Thank you. Thanks for, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I hope everyone has a, a safe and uh, uh, happy and hopefully prosperous uh, Memorial Day weekend here going into the, the kickoff of the summer. So, so thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. So um, you see on your screen, the shift uh, to Andy Markowski. Uh, Andy, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Senator. How are you? I'm doing okay. You know, Andy, you and I go back a long way as well. You're, uh, you know, you've been involved in uh, in State House Associates for, you know, seven or eight years now uh, up at the Capitol, and uh, been a director of the uh, the State Director of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, which is where you and I first came into contact since 2007. Uh, and you've had a long career in in legal and public affairs and uh, you know, you're developing a great young family, which is probably getting, uh, you know, older than you and I talked. We're having babies now. They're, they're probably ready for kindergarten now. And, uh, <laughs> Even beyond that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing what they're doing in, in kindergarten these days with homeschool. And I, I think my, my kindergartner knows how to use Zoom better than I do right now. Yeah, I know. I was saying that I don't have any teenagers here to help me with this process, but we probably could use kindergartners and first graders to help us. But, uh, but you and I are also on the, the NFIB Leadership Council, and it's a great honor for me to help uh, serve and keep abreast. I haven't been all that active uh, lately other than, you know, talking to you. You, you may have been on a little bit with, with uh, Dan uh, talking about the restaurant industry and specifically and how it's affected furloughs, layoffs, uh, you know, Main Street economics and, and, you know, what we need to do to get going. You represent 
you know, a wider range of businesses. And maybe if you would start out a little bit talking about who NFIB is, and uh, if you want to add anything about, you know, your participation in that. And uh, it's a great organization and does a lot for business around the country. So, uh, you know, take us through that and then maybe what you're seeing with some of these businesses in, in Connecticut and, and, you know, what, what can we do to, to, you know, to move us forward? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Senator. And, um, you know, there's no better champion for small business up there at the state capitol as, as you, because, uh, you know, you live it, you breathe it, uh, you've built a business from the ground up. And, and that's something that you have in common with, as you know, many of our NFIB members, many small business owners, not just the restaurant owners. Um, and, and yeah, you know, the, the Connecticut Restaurant Association, a great organization as well. And, you know, I've been in touch with, um, with Scott, their executive director throughout this process. And, you know, just for the, the restaurant owners on the phone to know as well that, you know, NFIB is, is backing up CRA as best we can. We're, we're on the same page with you guys. Uh, we have a lot of overlapping membership. And, uh, you know, speaking of membership, so as, as you mentioned, you know, NFIB, National Federation of Independent Business, um, we are Connecticut's and the nation's leading small business advocacy organization. We've represented small businesses for over 75 years in, in all 50 states and at the federal level. Um, our membership is, you know, scattered across the state in nearly any industry you could think of that employs a small business from literally the mom and pop shops, the, the small one and two and three person pizza joints on Main Street, single person uh, sole proprietors who are operating online, uh, whether they're selling on eBay or an Etsy shop, um, to more sophisticated businesses with 25, 30, 50 employees, small manufacturers, transportation companies, uh, professional service firms, and, and even construction. Uh, so, so you name it, we, we represent a, a cross section of, of small businesses. And um, I think as everybody knows right now, they've, they've been hit hard, some, some industries more than another. Um, but the one thing I think that, that all small businesses have in common throughout this is they want to do their best. They want to do their best for their employees. They want to do the best for their business and their customers to be able to stay open, uh, to, to keep having, uh, providing a product or a service. Uh, they want to be able to keep the lights on and, uh, and, and keep food on their own tables. Um, and they also, they also want everyone to be safe. And that's an area where they have a lot of questions in terms of, you know, what they need to do to comply and, you know, what does this new world we're living in, at least for the time being, look like? Um, so I'm fielding questions every day, as I know you are, and, and several of your colleagues in the legislature. And I think we all just need to, you know, keep sharing information and answering the questions as best we can. Um, we are a resource here at NFIB, uh, just like you are in the state legislature. And, you know, we encourage any small business owner who has questions to, you know, look us up and contact us. We, we talked a little bit in the first segment with Dan about uh, restaurants reopening yesterday uh, in terms of outside dining, inside dining and bars, certainly are not open, uh, and, uh, but we're, we're kind of dipping our toe in the water with the, with the outside. Um, some of the other uh, small businesses were able to open, more retail uh, was able to open, and I, you know, I for one was confused about you know, the large uh, department stores being able to be open, and yet you know, uh, the smaller retail uh, places would, would have to be closed. Uh, even though they probably were easier to control the number of people in and out of there. Uh, but now, um, now that they're being able to start being open, uh, Electric Boat, I believe, Sikorsky and Pratt have all been open uh, all along. Uh, the large manufacturers, are some of the small manufacturers, are, have, have they been closed? Are they reopening? Are they moving? What are some of the other industries that, that were able to open up uh, some of your members yesterday? And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, where do you see that going from your perspective? Yeah, great, great question. Um, you know, manufacturing, obviously, a, a very important industry here in Connecticut. Um, you know, manufacturing, uh, fortunately, was, was deemed an essential business early on, uh, which was somewhat of a different tact than, than other states took. Um, but that said, um, out of an abundance of caution, particularly some of the smaller shops did shut down. 
um, you know, for ver various reasons, an abundance of caution, um, unclear what the future would look like for them. Um, supply chains in, in certain areas dried up, dried up pretty quickly. Um, you know, your point about the, the retailers and some of the big box stores, so to speak, is, is very well taken. That is a common um, uh, complaint that I've heard from, from NFIB members who just had questions wondering why, why they couldn't be open, but yet um, a, a store that might sell a similar product, um, but just happened to be uh, also selling an essential product and therefore was deemed essential, was able to stay open. Um, I know there will some, some people say, well, you know, certain businesses were able to offer online services or curbside uh, pickup, um, but unfortunately not every business is equipped for that. Um, you know, several businesses were able to turn on a dime. Uh, small business owners by their nature are entrepreneurial and, and some of them did what they had to do to adopt and, and you were seeing some really creative things out there. Um, Unfortunately for others, uh, it's just not profitable to operate at a, a reduced capacity. And I certainly know that's the case in the restaurant industry. And it's the case for, for many other small businesses too. Um, only being able to bring in one or two employees, only being able to offer curbside uh, pickup or online ordering just isn't the same as having customers visit your physical facility. You know, uh, you, you know you're so right. And it everybody's different, but they're, everybody's the same in, in a way, you know, the, the, everybody's business is unique and a reflection of their inner passion and, and how they're doing it. And it's all about service and, uh, and support and uh, job creation and, you know, small businesses, the job creation, creation, creators for, you know, uh, the majority of people, it's 70, 80% uh, nationwide and certainly in Connecticut. Well, the big businesses get the play, but it's the small job creators that, uh, that are really doing the work. There's a question that has come in about open air venues, and I, I don't know if you have any. Uh, I know places like the Guard and the Bushnell and uh, a number of those places are really suffering uh, about, it's very difficult to get that, one, the numbers together, and two, you can't have any distance. Um, I, the only thing in response to this question that I have, Andy, is the opening of open air event venues um, would be the beaches. Uh, some of the beaches that were closed locally are starting to uh, reopen again, is, and everybody needs to be mindful of, of the six-foot spacing. And I would expect that some of these open-air venues would probably be in the same boat, although I've not heard specific. We'll follow up with whoever asked that question uh, and see if we can get more information from the governor. But are you seeing anything with those types of things or is that a, a segment of the of the business industry that you're involved with um, it's it's actually the uh, I guess what I would call sort of the the back end of that industry um, several NFIB members who are caterers or uh, event logistics companies uh, the the people who do the audio and visual and lighting uh, people who do tents um, services and suppliers who, you know, rent chairs and tables, that sort of thing. Uh, they have taken a, a big hit. Uh, the, the event marketplace in general, large gatherings, as you know, has, uh, you know, things have, things are being canceled well into the fall at this point. And, you know, these are businesses that provide, you know, services and supplies to outdoor venues or large gatherings. And they've just had contracts, canceled and, and the business has dried up. They don't know what their future's like. So I've been hearing a lot from them in terms of when can things open so they can prepare when they can bring staff back, how do they ramp up operations? Um, if they were the recipient of a loan, for example, how long they can stretch out those funds, those types of things. Yeah, and you know, certainly the catering industry is, is a part of the food industry, but it's also very much a part of the business of creating the food industry, which is the back, uh, you know, the background support vendors, as you talked about tables and lighting uh, and music and sound. We have to think about all of that. Those are uh, things, tents and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of uh, repercussions that are happening when you have to cancel a catering event, photography, videography, uh, flowers, uh, you know, all of these things are touching small businesses everywhere. And, you know, a lot of people that were, you know, had weddings scheduled for this summer 
you know, are, are, are canceling them and pushing them off because they're not sure, or even if they are, they, you know, you can't really uh, do a wedding dance six feet apart. So, uh, you know, those are the things that, uh, that are going to get all shoved into next year. And, and I'm sure there are a lot of things that have been booked already for next year. And so it's going to make it a little more difficult, but uh, tough to be safe. And so the open air venues, you talked a little bit about supply chain. And that's one of the things I've been talking about early on. Uh, there's a lot of conversation, support local, buy local, all the local chambers are pushing that. You've been a, a champion for that for many, many years that I've known you. And uh, people think that if they come to a local retail spot or a local restaurant or a local, they, you know, they buy from a, a local gift shop, um, they're supporting just that. But, but what really happens is it moves up the food chain. And in the case of food, you know, we have fishing vessels that are used to dropping off 30,000 pounds of fish at a time and meat packers that make tons of food at a time. And I, I read of a pork uh, manufacturer in the Midwest that closed producing 3 million pounds of pork a day. I, I can't even wrap my head around how, how you even do that. Uh, and they're closing, uh, you know, and, and chicken plants, Tyson is closing a couple of chicken plants. And, and so the supply chain above us all is, is teetering. And, you know, we need to make sure that by, by supporting the, the boots on the ground here, that really uh, gives us the opportunity to buy upstream and, uh, and, and help those big guys stay supported. Because if we lose the big guys, you know, we, we could, we could be paying a lot of money for chicken in in, uh, in the next few in the next few months because we can't just start that up on a dime. Are are you seeing that with manufacturing and other other supply chain uh, that you know may buy widgets from from Canada or Mexico or China somewhere? Yeah, I've 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 heard some some stories about that. Um, you know, it, 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 some of that is is industry. Um, specific. The the nice thing here in Connecticut, at least with with manufacturing and, and even some of our other um, sort of niche businesses, is we do have this unique ecosystem, and and small businesses in particular tend to want to support each other. Um, so you know they they do their best to support each other. But if if you think about how things you know work throughout the supply chain, um, you know the manufacturing company that uh, has their orders uh, slowing down or dried up is no longer uh, needing to run as many trucks from the transportation company uh, that they contract with to deliver those goods. And now there's repercussions on, on that transportation company and uh, that transportation company, which is dealing with other industries. And so there's this sort of trickle down effect to everybody. Um, and you know, the other thing I've been hearing about and, and just was on a call today with some folks, um, you know, a lot of people throughout this entire pandemic are you know, thinking, uh, businesses that are consumer facing. Well, a lot of our small businesses that are NFIB members are, are business to business um, uh, companies in terms of the services and products that they provide, or, or even in many cases, um, business to government. And uh, you have um, a lot in the construction industry, for example, uh, specialized uh, trades, uh, mechanical contractors, et cetera, who had contracts with various municipalities or other uh, public agencies that have either been postponed or canceled. So um, you've got another segment of work that's drying up because of sort of the, the fiscal uncertainty that's out there. Yeah. And it, it's, it, you just can't start that back up on, you know, in, in the moment, it takes a while to kind of get the, the gears greased up and moving and, and, and get it going. And I think that's some of the biggest concern that, that uh, many people have about the economy moving forward. Uh, you know, the state budget's taken a huge hit. Uh, I think we're down nearly a billion dollars this last quarter as a result of income tax revenue being deferred out to July and sales tax revenue being, uh, you know, drying up because people aren't buying. And, you know, I'm hopeful that you know, while that's going to be difficult to, to recover from, if we can get this economy going and keep people safe, uh, you know, the turnaround should be should be much quicker than, than I'm, I'd like to be hearing. And uh, are, are you hearing that same 
type of confidence or lack of confidence from, from your members in, in terms of how we're moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think NFIB members generally are, are they want to be optimistic. Um, that everyone's hoping for sort of that, that steep, you know, V-shaped recovery to come out of this. Um, there are many of our members who are, you know, ready to go and sort of, they understand the public health and safety needs, um, but they also feel that um, they perhaps are, are best empowered to, uh, they know how to protect their workplaces, their customers, their employees, uh, it is in their best interest to do so. And, you know, the one size fits all uh, approach that, that comes down from state government sometimes isn't always necessarily best suited to the needs of, of every small business that's out there. Um, but, you know, NFIB members, you know, to your point, they're, they're concerned about the, the state economy. They're concerned about the state budget situation. Um, you know, we, we, want to get through this, we are going to get through this. But I think the, the message that I'm already hearing from small business owners is, you know, state officials, uh, from a public policy perspective, you know, don't do anything that's going to damage any sort of recovery. Um, everyone's talking about money, everyone says there's a need for revenue, whether it's the state budget, whether it's the unemployment trust fund, um, you name it, but there needs to be uh, resistance to the temptation to automatically say we need more revenue so where does it come from tax increases fee increases um, small business owners have have seen this play before unfortunately uh, the last time there was a, a major recession and, and the state unemployment insurance fund for example had a big downturn the state had to borrow money from the federal government and all employers were were assessed with a surcharge to pay back that loan uh, just as the economy was starting to recover. That's the last thing that needed to happen then. And it's certainly the last thing that needs to happen now. So I think that is really where the, the confidence and the optimism will come from, from small business owners, if they can see good fiscal decisions being made at, at the state and, and local levels. Yeah, and there, there's some conflicting messages coming out, certainly from the federal government with uh, programs that were designed to help offset uh, business uh, keeping their staff members off unemployment, uh, providing the, the PPP program, payroll protection program, getting them in there. And then yet uh, on the other side of the coin, the, the supplement to the unemployment fund, uh, which allows people to get an extra $600 a week. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell people to come back to work part time when you're making, you know, that, that supplemental thing. And who can blame people? I mean, you can't. And, and a lot of people, that money is playing catch up to the, to the time that they lost. So uh, it just is this conflicting, uh, conflicting opportunities that I think we need to kind of measure and balance and, uh, uh, because eventually uh, we're going to have to pay a lot of that stuff back and, and we're going to have to figure out how we do it. And we need a robust Main Street, I think, to do so. But safety is key. Safety is a is, uh, first and foremost. And I think, uh, you know, small business owners know that they are passionate, passionate about what they provide. Uh, and, you know, most of them go home at night to their families. And so they certainly don't want to take an unsafe situation and bring it back into, uh, into their home. So, uh, you know, the, the hair salons this week, when we're talked about being in phase one and they're allowed to open up and many of them said, okay, that's okay by me. We can figure this out and spent thousands, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to get in their shop open. Uh, and then there's a group that says, you know, we don't want to open. We don't think it's safe. We, we're too close to our clients. Uh, and, and so the governor acquiesced and said, no, uh, you know, those are the messages that are difficult. And, uh, you know, you don't want to pit people from the same industry against each other. We want to be able to take measured steps to move forward to make sure everybody's safe. And, uh, and, and I think those are some of the things we're looking to the administration and to legislature for. Uh, but quite frankly, the legislature has been closed since early March. Uh, session is officially over as of May 6th. Uh, and, you know, the governor has his executive authority and emergency powers until September. 
And uh, in the beginning, there was some collaboration between the leaders and, and the legislature, uh, but that seems to have been moved away a little bit. And, and the governor is, uh, is just uh, leading through executive orders without collaboration uh, from leaders, I think, of both sides of the legislature. You know, you and I uh, see each other quite often up in Hartford. You spend uh, most of your days to let, that the session is open up there doing the good work that you do, lobbying for small business interests and, and uh, the other clients you have. Uh, you know, in, in the couple minutes we have left, do you, do you miss the Capitol up there? Is it, uh, you, you know, are you saying, oh, good, I'm happy for this break or you know, there's a lot of folks up there that we used to see on a daily basis that, uh, you know, we don't see as much anymore. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's certainly been a strange, a strange spring. That's for sure. Um, and, you know, most of my other colleagues in, in the lobbying business who I've spoken with all kind of feel the same way, too. Um, you know, it was a nice little break for about two weeks. And then after that, it got old and, and you know, we're used to falling into a routine this time of year and and, you know, by and large, like you said, you know, we're, we're in the people business, we're in the information business. And, um, you know, we're all adapting to this new normal, at least in the short term of, you know, communicating over, over video conference and zoom, et cetera. Um, you know, being an advocate, um, it's, it's certainly, uh, a little bit more nuanced to get the attention of, of public officials and, and get information and get answers. You know, we're doing everything through, through email and phone calls and text messages now, um, but but there's nothing like that that in person interaction. Uh, so I definitely do miss that, and uh, you know I think I think that's what a lot of small business owners feel too. You know they they thrive on people, they thrive on the energy, they they like being in their shop or their store and interacting with their employees and their customers. Um, so you know I think everybody is hoping for that that return to normalcy or at least somewhat uh, somewhat normalcy uh, sooner than later. Well, let's, let's hope that that happens uh, quicker, uh, sooner than later. Uh, thank you for you know, joining us on this half hour. I'm going to uh, break off and answer some of the, the questions that people have sent in. Uh, you know, you're welcome to hang around while I do that. But thank you very much for being, uh, being on with us today and sharing your insights on small business and hope that you'll, we'll do this again and, and you come back. And if there's any questions that people out there have, for small business, we'll make sure I have, as I said, a great staff monitoring Sarah and Peggy, who are just terrific at what they do and in helping us do what we do. Um, they'll get these questions to you, Andy, if you don't mind, and maybe you know you can help us out with some of these answers. But thanks very much, and and my best to your family uh, through the end of this. So so stay safe and thank you. I will. Thank you, Senator, and we will be in touch. And uh, I look forward to coming down and uh, grabbing a meal sometime this summer, hopefully. We'll have a six foot cup of coffee to, together and, uh, you know, hopefully it'll, the distance will get shorter as we, as the time goes. But That's right. Well, thank you again. And uh, again, you know, for, for everyone on, on and yourself and your staff, consider NFIB a resource, uh, reach out to us, uh, check out our webpage, NFIB.com. Uh, a lot of great resources and information out there for small business owners. And any business can, can join and talk to you and get answers. And I know that, that you have people that will provide all that information. So it's nfib.com. Uh, so, so reach out. It's a great, great organization. It works very hard for small business and the job producers of our state. So thanks, Andy, very much. Uh, I got just a couple of minutes left to go into some of these questions. Um, we've talked about barber salons. Uh, you know, uh, the one question is about what are we doing? Uh, what is the state doing to increase COVID-19 testing? Um, the, the nursing homes have been hit extraordinarily hard. Uh, we need to find a solution to that. The testing, a lot of that is going to nursing homes and assisted living uh, and correctional institutions. And in both cases, nursing homes and correctional institutions, both the residents, the inmates, and the staff are going to get an up, up uh uptick in testing uh, so we can try to get it. I've asked for results on testing per county. Uh, you know, we get a daily uh, comment from the governor, a number of tests that are being performed today versus yesterday. I would like to see that broken down by county so we can say X number of tests were in New London County and this was the number that we had um, seen as an increase or a decrease in 
in uh, infection. So I think it'll give us a little better input and I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful we'll be able to get that. Tim uh, from Niantic is asking what to be done to address the steep increase in the private club, specifically VFW. That was an unintended consequence of the Liquor Overhaul Act that uh, was passed last session. Um, it, it aligned those clubs with cafe permits and, and the prices, you know, would jump from two or three hundred dollars a year for these small clubs up to what cafes that actually are in the business of selling liquor for a profit. Um, they're up, upwards to two thousand dollars a year. Nobody wants to see those uh, these clubs. It was, uh, as I said, an unintended consequence. And there's been discussions with the chair of the general law committee. Senator Whitkos, who's the ranking member, uh, has been doing some uh, work on that. And the agreement, if we, when we get into special se session, the agreement is that those, uh, cap those cafe will stay the same, but the private clubs will revert back to the, to the dollars that they were being charged. So there's a solution uh, working on that. Um, the senior housing question from Terry and Montville, uh, talking, uh, we're, we're reaching out to the, uh, the agency on uh, aging uh, to see if we can get some answers. And we're also going to talk to the housing commissioner uh, and see what we're doing. And we'll be able to get back to you on, on those and maybe put that on my website, senatorformica.com. Uh, Mail-in voting for the August 11 primary was a question. The May 20th executive order yesterday enables the secretary of state to send out absentee ballot applications uh, to people who request them, I believe, uh, and, and they're able to vote uh, by absentee uh, for the uh, primary. Remember, the governor's uh, emergency powers expire in September, and uh, at that point, things that he's done in executive order revert back. Uh, so uh, there was a question from Peter from Waterford about wanting to know about the state's plan for contact tracing. Uh, my staff, my great staff, Sarah, Peggy, and Kim are looking into that uh, and we'll get back to you. So as we wrap up uh, this very quick hour uh, that I've been able to share with you, I want to remind you the, some resources on senatorformica.com, uh, education, distance, learning. Um, you know, if you're, if you're uh, teaching your kids at home or if you just want to learn a little bit about a, a little more things while you have some time, um, you can even look up tours of uh, the Mystic Seaport and museums around the state uh, will give you online uh, and virtual touring. There's information on cybersecurity if you have questions. There's senior citizen resources and mental health resources. We had the great group from Safe Futures uh, seeing such an uptick of uh, domestic violence because people are closed in a little bit longer and the stresses of this pandemic are are, are reaching uh, you know newer heights. So great organizations that that work to support the the victims of domestic violence are seeing an uptick in their work. So they could use some support. Uh, I was able to help them with a few things uh, so far, and I'm happy to be able to do that. If you live in any of the towns of the eight di uh, eight towns in the 20th district, um, we have links. Uh, to all the contact information for each of those towns on senatorformica.com. And uh, if, as I close, I again want to thank my, my great staff for helping. Thank Dan Miser and uh, for all he's doing to put um, the concerns and the, and the trials and tribulations of the restaurant industry through the Connecticut Restaurant Association and his work on the state's advisory council Three great restaurants he has out there in Mystic go out and support uh, two of them. One is under remodeling, the Oyster Club, but the Engine Room and, uh, and uh, Grass and Bone are out there. Andy Markowski, thank you too to you for all of your hard work pushing small business uh, and industry in the state of Connecticut. Any questions you may have about uh, that group, nfib.com, or let us know and we will, we will get some answers for you. Uh, you know, Dan said it, I guess all of our dads have said it, but my dad used to say it too, this too shall pass. Uh, and we are working. We need, to, we need to do better with our nursing home folks and get a handle on that. Uh, we need to stay safe and be mindful, take personal responsibility of, 
of our own safety so that we protect not only our safety, but the safety of others, uh, then this will, this will pass uh, and get back to whatever our normal is going to be. But, but thank you for watching. Uh, again, senatorformica.com. If you have any questions or if you need any help, my email is paul.formica at cga.ct.gov. And we will, we will try to help you however it is we can. So thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And, you know, stay safe, be well, live your life. It's beautiful out there. The, I think the beaches are open. Go get some fresh air, go for a walk, breathe deep and be grateful for all that we have in the greatest district, in the greatest state, in the greatest country in the world. Thank you very much.